Hello and welcome to another TRADOC Leader Professional Development Discussion. I'm Matt Sandisbert, Deputy Director of the Army Mad Scientist Initiative within the TRADOC G2, and I'm also the moderator for today's event. First, I'd like to welcome the TRADOC Commanding General, General Gary Brito. Sir, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Glad to be with you, Mike. Sure. And I'd also like to welcome the Director of the Navy Warfare Development Center, Mr. Michael Durkin. Mr. Durkin, thank you for joining us and welcome to TRADOC. Yeah. Matt, appreciate that. Uh, General, thank you for the invitation. I uh, look forward to talking about Navy for, uh, awesome. for an hour with you and your TRADOC warriors. Well, I promise you I won't talk about the Army-Navy game in December, if we unless we have to. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So our topic today is Joint Forces Multi-Domain Operations. Before we get into that topic, however, I'd like to take a few minutes to allow you both to give some opening remarks. And General Brito, let's start with you. Sure. Well, one, thanks for the opportunity, Mike. And I, I think any opportunity we as members of the Joint Force, whether civilian professionals or uniform, get to talk about war fighting at a very strategic level, it's, it's very valuable. Uh, it's, it's clear to me that the, uh, not just me, but partly due to some of the great work that the, uh, the, our TRADOC G2 has done, the operational environment's different. Uh, and closer to what we do as a command, it's still important to maintain some some really good war fighting readiness on a basic blocking and tackling, but we can't take our eye off of a very big, expansive operational environment that not only the services have to be good in their respective lane, but it's very clear to me success on the battlefields, uh, whether that's water, or land, or a combination of both, mm -hmm. will become a joint issue right now. Mm -hmm. So we're very happy for this opportunity. One is just to increase dialogue with a, a branch service neighbor, which is literally right down the road from us. Mm -hmm. And any opportunity we can talk about training or just interoperability is, is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Durkin? Yeah, Matt, thank you. Um, General, again, thank you for the invitation to participate. Uh, I think the audience saw my bio. They know I was a career naval officer, spent most of my career at sea. Um, but uh, today, as the director of Navy Warfare Development Center, for a minute, I'd like to tell a little bit about what Navy Warfare uh, Development Center does, and then uh, we can get into the discussion, sir. Um, First off, I've had the opportunity to serve uh, uh, under several uh, uh, prominent uh, Army officers in my career. Um, when I was in the Joint Staff, my OSD counterpart was uh, then Colonel, now Ambassador Carl Eikenberry. And uh, we had the opportunity to take uh, General Shally Kashvili to China. It was the first chairman's visit to China in over 20 years. This was back in the mid-90s. Uh, subsequent to that, my last tour, I was the Navy uh, Global Force Management Director, and uh, my counterpart on the Joint Staff was then this colonel named Mark Milley. I think maybe some of you uh, remember I've that name as well. Them. So uh, I've had the opportunity to learn from uh, these, uh, uh, these very uh, distinguished Army generals and uh, uh, it's helped me along my career. Uh, Navy Warfare Development Center uh, is an S3 organization, sir, that kind of straddles the OPNAV staff and the fleet. Um, I report directly to U.S. Fleet Forces Command General Darrell, excuse me, Admiral, he'll get me for that, Admiral Darrell Cottle. And um, uh, what we do there is we have uh, six uh, primary areas of responsibility. Uh, we manage the Navy's uh, warfighting concept development process, DMO being one of those concepts, distributed maritime operations. We look to identify solutions to prominent military problems and uh, make recommendations to uh, attack those. We also execute the fleet experimentation program that seeks out and examines material and non-material solutions that are uh, near fleet ready to enhance uh, the fleet's capabilities and close some capability gaps. We also uh, lead Navy's cross integration, in, cross domain integration. What I mean by that, across the Navy's different warfare communities, we uh, uh, partner with them as well as allies and uh, uh, the joint uh, organizations, uh, ALSA, for example, and Joint Staff J7, for integration of cross domain training and tactics. We also execute the Navy's Operational Level of War Training Program, and that's where our Maritime Operations Centers come in. We train and certify the Fleet Headquarters Maritime Operations Centers. So that's a relatively uh, new uh, initiative that uh, allows us to ensure that we're ready to uh, execute mission command for the fleets. 
And finally, uh, we oversee the Navy Doctrine Development Program, and that's where NWDC got its start with the War College back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And we, we work on the development of not only Navy Doctrine, but joint multi-service and allied doctrine. And uh, finally, we execute the Navy Lessons Learned Program, trying to capture those lessons learned and get them rapidly out to the fleet. Mm -hmm. so well, like Mike, thanks for that. And Matt, if I can mm -hmm. add more for the audience as well, very helpful. And I had the opportunity to read the bio as well, but just to hear you talk about the mission of NWDC, uh, minus the, the platform, the Navy ship, and, 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 and where we operate, right. I would say our missions are pretty similar. Uh, yes, capturing lessons learned, uh, developing war fighting sustainable doctrine for the Army, yes, um, and, and one of our acronyms, the Dotland PF integration mm -hmm. of, of the system, tied to the doctrine leader training, uh, doctrine organization, training leader development education tied to a p platform, mm -hmm. in your case a Navy ship and maybe a new tank or a helicopter for us. Right. Uh, we share the same mission on a different scale, of course. If I could add, mm -hmm. uh, when I first heard about this uh, opportunity, this LPD, it reminded me, Lurie as a, as a young, I'd say a mid-grade mid -grade captain, I won a uh, training exercise on the USS Mount Whitney. Oh, very good. Uh, it was about, it was in uh, 1998. I'm dating yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah. But what I learned in that exercise, it was part of the joint staff, on, on the, literally on the ship, on the water, mm -hmm. was mission analysis, deliberate decision-making process, how you work through operations orders, how you direct actions. Sure. Might be a different word, a lingo here and there, but it's to deliver the same thing. Mm -hmm. right. And even at that young age, um, again, dating myself, I was stationed at the National Training Center in Puerto Rico, California, a mm -hmm. bunch of dirt, but applied what was learned on that ship to, there's probably no big operation that's gonna be a single service. And that was way back then. And I see it even more so now. So it's, it's funny how history kind of circles itself. That's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a great insight, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure does, sir, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, um, you're right, it's, the joint fight is the way we're going to execute in the future, and mm -hmm. uh, um, so uh, the, any opportunity we have to get our forces together and train uh, together, study together, uh, however we do that in war games or out in the field or out at sea, you know, it only benefits us. 100% and, and communicate uh, mm -hmm. through the same network in some cases if exactly. we can and uh, spot on. So looking forward, it's great. Yeah, that was, that was a great start to the discussion, great introduction. Uh, allow me to thank you both again for joining me today. Before we tackle that big theme that we just kind of alluded to here, it'd be helpful to establish a baseline first. So here at Trade Oxer, as you alluded to in your response, our mission, or one of our missions, is to define, describe, and deliver the operational environment to the Army. It's the foundation for training and leader development. The OE shapes how we transition the force, train them, and develop doctrine. So, from both of your purviews, what does the OE look mm -hmm. like now? Very complex. Uh, operational environment is very complex, and I could, it could probably take us back a couple of days as a young officer. We looked a lot at the terrain mm -hmm. and understanding the enemy that was on the, the ground, but it's much more complex than that. And I think can, I'll take risk in speaking for all servers, and I think we tried to understand the complexity of all the domains, everywhere from the dirt up to the cyber. Mm -hmm. And the impacts of non-kinetic threats as well. You know, it could be the push of a button that shuts you down through cyber, um, just as effectively as the push of the tank round or the push of the missile from a Navy ship is just as mm -hmm. effective. So it, it makes a very big world small. Mm -hmm. And it also gives challenges to force projection, the ability to get there. And my opinion underscores the importance of the interoperability amongst the services and any training opportunities we can get at with that to, to get at this complex world, politics can be part of it. Uh, I do believe, and this takes us back to the young days and, and uh, where, where we, all, we all are brought up this way, to understand the enemy first, mm -hmm. expand that to the operational environment of which all of our joint capabilities need to operate in and be effective. And as Mike mentioned, any opportunity, even some warfighter exercise or something like this, where you just discuss things and understand how we would be effective as a U.S. fighting force, it's important. And uh, I, I could lift, lift, uh, give a couple of examples, but I don't want to take too much of the mic time. It's also important, Matt, to, to, I think to understand time now. And, and mm -hmm. if I may take just a second, mm -hmm. I'll get off the stage. 
for about 15 to 20 ish years, the military, not just the Army, but the military, was involved for all the right reasons in the counterinsurgency war. Iraq and Afghanistan and all that went on with it post 911, since 911. Mm -hmm. As we understand the operational environment, it's clear that we have to have the capability to kick butt and win in a large scale combat operation yeah. environment, multi domain operation environment. So that aspect of the OE has changed. Mm -hmm. And not to keep beating the drum, but I, I do think it underscores the importance of being good in your service and being great as part of the joint force. And that's in all multi domain operations guard, uh, doctrine. Yes. I'll stop there. Mr. Durkin? Yeah, thanks, Matt. General, uh, along the same lines of looking back, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, I'll uh, show my age here and that, you know, in my 40 plus years of being associated with the Navy in and out of uniform, um, I think I've seen the Navy change multiple times in the operational environment. Um, Admiral Davidson, one of my former bosses and the former Indo uh, PACOM commander, I think put it well when we've, uh, in our 40 years, we've operated in four different navies. We started out in the Cold War, uh, Blue Water Navy, Soviet Union, our primary threat. Then comes the uh, collapse of the uh, Berlin Wall, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, and we're into kind of a peacetime Navy where um, uh, the, uh, our war fighting skills, I think, atrophied a little bit. Then, come 9-11, uh, we entered, as you, you know, pointed out, the, the, the war, global war on terror and how the Navy operated in support of the land operations in, in, in the Middle East for 20-plus uh, you know, mm -hmm. years. And then we come to today where post-GWAT we're into a great power competition where almost back to where we were 40 years ago where we have a blue water threat that we have to acknowledge and, 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 uh, how, and adjust our tactics and procedures to deal with that threat. Um, you know, the maritime environment, I think, you know, from our fifth grade geography, we all know that the water, the earth is 70 percent water and uh, include, including the littorals and the maritime along that, it, it gets even more. So that is the, the challenge we have in, in multiple AORs. You know, uh, the Western Pacific, you know, the, 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 everyone in the Pacific that's stationed out there will tell you it's a large ocean. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the, the challenges of dealing with that and the, the threats in that AOR. Then we go back to CENTCOM where we are today and uh, the threat that the Houthis and the, uh, all the Iranian proxies are, and where Navy ships are engaged today, you know, we're, we're facing a new th threat in that this is the first time that Navy ships have actually had to deal with anti-ship ballistic missiles, anti-ship cruise missiles, and one-way attack drones in, in uh, simultaneous and coordinated attacks. Mm -hmm. So the, the environment is changing, and our tactics and procedures have to be, you know, getting ahead of that. We can't fight the last war. We have to fight the, the next war, and, and I think that's where we're going. And it is going to be a joint fight, um, whether it's back to CENTCOM AOR, where we're supporting the land element, or in a maritime conflict in the Pacific, where um, the, uh, the land forces will play a key role in controlling um, straight passages, uh, uh, sea lines of communication, choke points, and uh, providing um, targeting and fires in support of the maritime forces. Mm -hmm. So um, a multi, I think it's a multi, uh, threat uh, operational environment and one that we have to be prepared to as a joint force to operate in all of them going forward. Yeah, yes, Mr. Sir. Durkin, if, if I may, mm -hmm. highlighted some really good points about the, uh, I think it underscores the importance of interoperability sir. as best we can. And when it comes, uh, I, I know we all tr train a vast force from everywhere from the private up to the, the mm -hmm. colonel, from the enlisted seamen up through the ensign in, in your respective mm -hmm. services. But the ability to develop agile leaders who mm -hmm. can think, analyze problems, but again, understand the operational environment, the enemy. Uh, and even with all the technology that we may have, uh, some of the threats that we face aren't all that technical. You mentioned the Houthis. Sure. It, it might be just, well, some folks on a speedboat that sure. can re wreak a lot of havoc mm -hmm. if we don't deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it may be a Navy ship or it may be a supporting brigade combat team mm -hmm. that's close by. Uh, so that, that truly underscores uh, always being combat ready 
regardless of the service, and whether it's basic blocking and tackling skills at the respective echelon, but those great examples you gave, and, and uh, some of the training now in the Pacific Theater, which we may talk about further on, underscores the importance of every opportunity to work at the lingo, the interoperability, the uniforms might be different, the budgeting might be different, but uh, we're, we're going to fight and win as, as a joint sure. force, so spot on. Sure. Yeah. That, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, the, the other thing about the operational environment is that, uh, you know, for, for many decades we've treated the Atlantic and the Pacific like a moat mm -hmm. where we were protected, mm -hmm. and the, the, that operational environment is going to change and that the, we, the threats to the homeland will also be something we'll have to factor in mm -hmm. going forward as uh, um, that we won't have the luxury like we did in World War II of taking the fight forward all the time and we, we will have to be aware of threats to the homeland as well in, in a future fight. Yeah, Mike, you illustrated well. I'm sorry for taking so much mic time yeah, absolutely. here. Absolutely. But um, ready to fight in different places in the world as well. Sure. You, mentioned, you mentioned what's going on in the CENTCOM AOR. I know there's a lot of training going on in the Indo-PACOM AOR. Sure. Uh, and we don't, we don't get the call where we're gonna be called to serve and, and fight and win. It could be both places which again underscores the, the necessity of, tr of training and being ready at all times. Then you have some challenges, I think all the services, I know our, our two in particular, have to manage it, manage it, manage it. Um, but the investments in future force capabilities, not only in training, but what's the next Navy ship in, in 2030? Uh, what's the tank that we need or the, or the next attacked aircraft in 2030? Mm -hmm. And that starts now. And getting into our staff level stuff, but that investment, training, and, and the, the Dalton PF integration to the left of that starts now, mm -hmm. or uh, you won't have a complete capability delivered when you need it. And there's risks that come with that, and hopefully the deterrence that our nation is working on will continue, I know it will, will allow us to ensure that we have uh, lethal fighting forces. Those are great points by both. It was great to see, uh, you know, how the Army and the Navy both view the operational environment and where those overlaps are, um, because you know the the key element there is there's lots of change that's going on, but transitioning from coin to now LISCO and great power competition, uh, but as well as kind of the heart of it was understanding the threat, as you say, sir. Paragraph one is paragraph one for mm -hmm. a reason. So it's good to see us both on the same page there. So I want to talk about MDO now, as you mentioned. Um, as highlighted in FM 3-0, Field Manual 3-0, operations, the success of multi-domain operations is dependent on joint partners working together. The Army has a substantial history of integration with the Air Force, air land battle for example, but less so when it comes to working with the Navy. NWDC is one of the chief proponents of distributed maritime operations, or DMO as you mentioned, sir, which looks to combine sea-based firepower with land-based counterparts. MDO and DMO are dependent on one another. So why is it so important now that the Army and the Navy work together so closely and forge that habitual relationship? Sir? I may be taking some risk with this statement, but I think our understanding of the our pacing threat in China, mm -hmm. um, public source information for the most part, we have a lot of threats around the globe, but what could potentially be a threat in China is not one that we, cannot, that we can't afford to overlook, and we're not as an army and a joint service. And the exercises, the planning, the partnership, I'll, I'll highlight Pacific Pathways, which I, have, I actually did one of those a couple of years back myself while stationed in Hawaii, underscores the, the, the necessity of the, of the partnership of all, of all the services, quite mm -hmm. frankly. And even though that part of the world has a lot of water, also has a lot of land, mm -hmm. and a lot of countries that have armies. Uh, so it just underscores the importance of any, any level of interoperability training you can do whether it's at the firing battery level, doing an exercise in a certain country, or, or deploying truly force projection, force projecting uh, people and equipment from one place to another, which involves all the services. And at a much larger strategic level, and I'll, I will be sure not to cross any classified lines, at joint exercise level, I know all that is, is talked about. And a non-doctrinal term, there's places you can look for efficiencies also. So if a piece of communication equipment can be uh, transmitted and received across all the services, there's no reason to have four different pieces of communication equipment. And that's looked at as well. When we look at modernization, uh, investment, and exercise interoperability. Uh, so it just truly underscores the importance. And 
Uh, perhaps a little later on I can talk to, we can both talk to some uh, training opportunities we've had or will have mm -hmm. that help touch that type of stuff. And with that, you know, back to the, the main topic in the operational environment, it's important that we both learn and continue to the capabilities of, of the adversary, uh, which can reach farther than they have ever had before, mm -hmm. whether it's kinetically or information operations or electronic warfare, and that impacts everybody. Mm -hmm. So again, as a, as a, as a joint force, uh, where you have both the intellectual capital, capital and even the, the kinetic capability that we both bring will help neutralize our adversaries if, if necessary. Sir? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the Army and Navy have a, a, uh, a history of working well together. I mean, when you go back and look at operations in World War II, North mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. Southern Europe, Normandy, the Philippines. We have come together and we've worked, uh, you know, the, worked the problem and have come out ahead in the, some of the most uh, significant times in, in our recent history. So I'm confident, just to start off by saying that we can, yeah, we'll make 100%. it work, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that the joint uh, uh, doctrine, JWC, joint warfighting concept, lays that out very well. And uh, I can tell you that Navy's all in on that. Um, uh, I have here for you, General, um, the CNO's navigation plan. I'd like to share that with you. Okay. And in there, you'll see that how she's laid out the Navy's plan for the her time in, in office and then out beyond that, out into the, uh, um, the next decade. And in there, it's very clear that Navy will be a uh, all in on the joint fight and that uh, um, the distributed maritime operations, that, that concept is how Navy is going to uh, support the joint fight. And mm -hmm. if, if I could, a little bit about DMO. Um, DMO came out in 2019. Um, as the Navy leadership recognized that we had, we were needed to prepare for the next fight. You know, we needed to get out of COIN, GWAT, and think about great power competition and how we would operate against the pacing threat. And um, the way we've done business in the past, even in World War II, in blue water operations, it, it won't work. You know, that we can't steam around in a tight formation because it's going to be obvious what that what that th that force is, what those ships are, and so we need to operate in a distributed manner. Where um, previous operations were very single carrier, strike group centric. You would know, have the carrier in the North Arabian Sea and the Arabian Gulf, you know, providing uh, power ashore. Uh, in the future fight, well, the uh, DMO concept is fleet centric. The maritime ops centers that we've, we've talked about at the fleet and numbered fleet uh, level will be executing mission command to uh, coordinate the operations of multiple carrier strike groups distributed over hundreds of miles. So you know, the importance of uh, integration of those forces and uh, those capabilities to mask the effects at a time and place of our choosing is is the goal of DMO. And I think it aligns well with joint warfighting concept, yeah. which came out a few years later. And the terms might be a little different. We use very maritime focused terms in DMO. Uh, but going forward, um, we uh, CNO will mention in there that she's writing her Navy warfighting concept. And in there, it will refresh DMO, if you will, uh, taking DMO and, and, and uh, aligning it to JWC and uh, using more joint terminology, if you will, so that uh, it's understood by all. You know, some of the critics of DMO said it's all how Navy's going to fight on its own. And it, those, those critics, I don't think, really read through it well enough to understand that, no, we understand it's a joint fight and Navy has a role. And like we talked about the operational environment, Whatever that is, Navy, Navy will, will take the appropriate role and support the joint fight to the best of our capabilities. And mm -hmm. so for Army integration, um, you know, th I think there's, like you said, there's opportunities for that and the need for that in that um, depending on the, which, which operational environment we're in, you know, who, 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 uh, which capabilities that those services bring is the right capability to take on that particular mission to, to deal with that threat. So going forward, I think that it, that's the importance of the Army-Navy relationship going forward. Oh, I appreciate it, McDurkin, Mr. Durkin. If I can add uh, 
When we had Air Land Battle Doctrine, mm -hmm. uh, it, was very, it was focused on <coughs> our understanding of the OE back then, which has obviously mm -hmm. evolved and has really taken on more of a necessity, as Mr. Dirk had mentioned, for the multi-domain ops. Uh, we also have Army, a new command, which this won't be news to anybody, uh, since Air Land Battle Doctrine, that's the Army Futures Command, which just crossed their sixth year mm -hmm. and work hand in hand with what TRADOC does mm -hmm. now. And uh, knowing the leadership and very, being good, good friends with the leaders in AFC, I know some of, the, some of the coordination across services on the Joint Warfighting Doctrine is being weaved into the thought and development, which they're there on the Army Warfighting Concepts for the future. Uh, very much a, a, a running estimate. It would be uh, easy to say in 2030, this is the doctrine we need, the Army Warfighting Doctrine, but it's longer than that. And I know for sure the coordination across the services right up there in the Pentagon has taken place mm -hmm. to help feed um, the, the doctrine and concepts on how the Army will be part of the multi-domain threat, working with other services as well. Innovation, modernization, training opportunities at the respective echelon all fund, fall underneath that. Uh, and not, not to beat the bumper sticker again, but I, I will continue to. It starts with all of us wanting to have not just a fair fight, overwhelming overmatch mm -hmm. against our adversaries. And, and that's all six domains plus and continues to be a threat. Yeah, absolutely, sir. And that coordination is imperative, mm -hmm. um, even within our own service in the Army. Oh, 100%, 100%. So when we created the you know, Tradox OE for, mm -hmm. for the, the current OE, we were working hand in hand with yeah. AFC's uh, future yep. OE. We helped them with their document. They helped ours, uh, mm -hmm. helped helped flesh out ours as well. So even within our own services, um, and it just shows how important the coordination is, especially when we start to talk about coordinating with with the Navy across yeah. joint service. Um, and that being said, joint service integration is difficult to say the least. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody here. To be successful, there must be cooperation and integration at multiple levels within each of the services. The Navy uses Maritime Operation Centers, as you mentioned, or MOCs, to standardize, standardize processes and ease partner integration, while the Army uses Battlefield Coordination Detachments, or BCDs, to ease integration between land and air assets and forces. So with increased cooperation, as we talked about, how do we need to account for the ways that MOCs and BCDs train together and integrate operations in real time? One, create opportunities for it. Uh, the BCDs have historically done a lot of integ great integration work between Army and Air Force uh, because those are the capabilities that were available and see cr increased opportunities to expand that for Army, Air Force, and what our Navy and other partners can, can, can offer. Now, there's not but so many BCTs that do a lot of theater effects. And I would also add, and maybe a little risky in this, in that the capabilities that our multi-domain task forces now bring, of which we didn't have in Air and Battle Doctrine, we're, we're creeping up on five to, to support all of the com combatant commands at this point, will be some added cap warfighting capabilities to synchronize many of the effects that can support not only the Army, but all services. And OPACOM is an example of one. I'll, I'll be careful not to cross any uh, classified lines. But to say that legacy coordination with just one service can continue to win the fight, no. Mm -hmm. That same level of training, uh, perhaps, perhaps some reorganization, I, I can't say how much, but training and, and interoperability opportunities amongst all the services uh, will continue to give us that overmatch we need and integrate uh, all the capabilities that the Army can bring to the Navy, the Navy can bring to the Army, and the Air Force can bring to all of us, mm -hmm. and our special operations. And even within the respective headquarters, which could be at the ASCC levels, uh, the COCOM levels, the Navy group levels, and maybe off in the doctrinal term there, Understood. It truly integrates all that we need to do in time and space mm -hmm. and the effect of what can be delivered. It's not just a matter of handshaking and talking to each other. You know, what can I do with this satellite that impacts his, the, the Navy's operations or vice versa? Or well, can this one radio system talk to all of the assets we have that could deliver fires yeah. or deliver fuel or mm -hmm. blood and stuff like that? So it's, it's, it would be naive to think a single service will win this scale of a fight anymore. Right. Sir? Couldn't agree with you more, General. Um, I think Admiral Franchetti is along the, has the, the same thoughts as well. You know, in her NAV plan, she highlights the importance of our maritime op centers. And you know, it's one of her uh, key tenets uh, of her navigation plan called, and it's called Fight from the Mock. 
and how we will execute uh, high-level warfare in, in the next fight where um, the mocks will do that uh, coordination, not just down and in within Navy forces, but across echelons to the other services, to the joint head, the joint, uh, whoever the JFC, Joint Force Commander is. Um, all of that will be done coordinated through the mock. Uh, across echelons, but down echelon to execute mission command for our distributed forces. You know, like I said, they could be thousands of miles apart, but the, the ability to maneuver and then mask the effects will, will be coordinated through our mocks. And in a joint fight, you know, that part of those fires, whether they're kinetic, non-kinetic, could be coming from Army forces uh, stationed in the theater. Um, you know, the, the, uh, if, if and when Army starts uh, uh, using Maritime Strike Tomahawk, a uh, fantastic weapon that can be used in, uh, in coordination with the fleet units to uh, uh, execute missions. So, you know, the, having something like the BCDs available to integrate with our mocks would be um, beneficial to both of us. Um, Navy has a similar organization to the BCD. Uh, it's called the NAIL, the Navy Naval and Amphibious Liaison Element that we embedded in the AOCs uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, CENTCOM AOR during the, during the fight, and uh, I think they perform similar missions. So I, I think at this level right now we're at the ex maybe exchanging liaison officers, but yes. I think as we look at going forward that the uh, uh, the BCDs or something similar to en you know enhance coordination with Navy and our nails possibly going to uh, wherever the Army headquarters is would be uh, something that we should look at pursuing. Well, thanks for mentioning. That's one note I'm going to take and look to. to I, I think I can help uh, share the benefit. Sure. Of that for sure, and matter of fact, make mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, pile on to that. More so in the last year, not not much longer. Even as some of our simulated warfighting exercises have been up gone to our next level, so a higher command, which is not just green, purple, has been involved with some of the training, which just gives more opportunity to, to kind of pull nails and BCT capabilities together. Mm -hmm. So I want to take that, and quite frankly, that's probably one of the biggest values. There's a lot of value of this discussion today, sure. but a big takeaway to reintegrate uh, or create opportunities for that that just didn't yeah. exist as much during yeah. the latter years of COIN. If I can add, this is something we all the services have been doing for a while, but definitely gotten better, I would say, just in my limited, limited perch over the last five to ten years, is that's education opportunities. Um, I personally went to a, a, a CFLIC course, which was a little bit of everything, all the services, wore civilian clothes, but a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. where you learn about the capabilities of, of, of delivering joint fires in one case. Uh, certain that many of our, uh, and it may just be one or two a year, exercises are, are purple. I would highlight Project Convergence and I'll give great credit to Army Futures Command on that. I think we're going to do our fifth one this year. And each one has gotten incrementally better at not only looking at service capabilities, but uh, at 29 Palms in Marie, uh, 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 sure. California just last right. last spring, the, the room had all kinds of uniforms in it, talking exactly the issues that we're bringing to the table now. And the light bulb was flashing and, and good ideas, risk, think barriers that we need to break through in order mm -hmm. to deliver this type of capability. So I thought it was quite exciting. That's so, outstanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, general project convergence. Uh, I mentioned one of the functions that NWDC does is the fleet experimentation program. Right. And we've had uh, experiments uh, embedded in project convergence yep. in past years, uh, uh, specifically uh, precision targeting long range fires and uh, communications. So uh, we value project convergence and look forward to uh, yeah. um, doing that. Uh, to your point about education, um, I'm a proud graduate of the Air War College, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, those kind of exchanges, and I think you're right that uh, um, the more interactions, I think at the War College levels, especially at the junior, le yeah. junior mm -hmm. courses, that our, our young officers get that, uh, that purple uh, flavoring into their careers early on 
to have a better understanding what the other services bring to the fight and you know where we see the the gaps that we need to close i think if we start that at an earlier level it, it will permeate up the chain through the years when that the, uh, uh, that our integration will be even that much more seamless going forward no 100 percent and and that's a very much formalized education opportunities not only uh, joint qualification for many of our leaders, officers, of course, but a little less formal exchange opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, like trade doc just being here can probably go across the street to work with the, uh, the Joint Force Elements in Suffolk or the Navy Elements here or the Air Force down in Langley. And I'm confident, having talked to some of my peers, that's happening at many unit levels as well. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's just it's simple, not nothing simple, but force projection, like you need an aircraft to get this vehicle on, deployed somewhere. That level of stuff ha mm -hmm. happens as well. So many of our schools, formal brick and mortar education is doing a mm -hmm. great job at it. I went to a joint one myself uh, for senior service college credit. And the entire class was a good mix of all services and a few three-letter agencies. But you really mm -hmm. learned about full government approach, uh, uniform included, of course, to deliver a war fighting capacity. And that was, uh, it was exciting. and. Intriguing as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the opportunities, education, I think that's a great point. And, sir, as you mentioned, the early on, I think, is, is pivotal as well. If you can inculcate that in the young soldiers and sailors, right. that mindset grows with them as they, as they go through their career. Um, we mentioned transitioning to LISCO. Uh, we mentioned great power competition. And we have a great example of that right now. We're seeing how important sustainment is if we look at Russia, Ukraine, right? Uh, logistics and sustainment are playing a pivotal role in that conflict as it's become a protracted war of attrition at this point. With China as the nation's pacing threat, we turn our attention to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's a region separated from us by the vast Pacific Ocean, as we mentioned, uh, with only small island chains intervening. The U.S. is going to have a tremendously difficult time simply getting to that fight without considering the challenges of logistics and sustainment. So in that open ocean, how do the Army and the Navy integrate capabilities to ensure flowing, protected lines of sustainment to maintain effective combat operations? You have to train, uh, but let me put a little caveat on that. I, I know a lot of that training won't take place from the mainland all the way through the indo mm -hmm. Um So we can leverage uh, live virtual constructive opportunities to, to exercise those muscles especially at the staff integration level. In some respects, you actually get more of a feel of that. And on a much smaller scale exercise, you can exercise the components of a big operation at a small scale. Like what does it take to deploy this brigade combat team through the island chains, through notional protection to a certain point mm -hmm. and part with a different army. It may be a, another complex aspect of it, but yet something we need to continue to sustain ourselves. How do we move fuel? Mm -hmm. from point A to point B across multiple time zones, interoperability with other countries, blood. I personally have seen some of those things on exercises as well. So leveraging our synthetic training environment opportunities, fully leveraging live virtual constructive training opportunities, perhaps partnered with dirty boots, dirt ocean type opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then, then uh, higher level AESCC exercises when you can down to the lowest echelon all gives us those types of opportunities. But we would be a fool to not take the challenge head on. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's a lot of water, a lot of land, a lot of, yet a lot of armies, and all that needs to be exercised, not only with the Navy, but Marine Corps partners as well. Uh, so you have to force project, you have to protect, and you have to deliver combat capabilities. Taking too much mic time. I'll turn <laughs> it over. General, you're, you're spot on, sir. Um, you know, the Navy recognizes that mm -hmm. challenge. Contested logistics is, uh, as you, you can see in CNO's NAV plan, is mm -hmm. one of her uh, uh, top priorities. And we are uh, taking that challenge head on from a, n a number of areas. Uh, first off, just capacity. You mentioned getting yeah. fuel. Well, sea lift is the way that the fuel is going to get from CONUS to the fight. And you know, building that capacity, um, SecNav has been very uh, aggressive going out and, and looking to develop uh, more uh, infrastructure that can support building the type of ships we need to execute that. Um, at the same time, uh, we're looking at uh, you know how do we uh, how do we do that at, at the tactical level? 
Uh, one of the concepts we worked with the Marine Corps Distributed Maritime Logistics Operations talks about how we would uh, work with the Marines for their uh, small expeditionary units, you know, uh, in the islands or in other locations, and you know, how do we how do we sustain them in the fight, and how do we move them from one place to the other? You know, part of DMO is maneuver, and you know, JWC expanded right. maneuver. So you know, okay, we're going to move them, but how do we sustain them when they get there, mm -hmm. and, and how do we rearm them, refuel them, et cetera? So those are all. Um, our challenges, you know, a carrier strike group can move between five to seven hundred miles a day. So in the expanse of the Pacific, how do our supply ships keep up with them to be able to do that refuel, rearm uh, that's necessary to sustain them in the fight? Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, a lot of considerations there, but it's uh, really on top of uh, uh, CNO's list of challenges, and mm -hmm. we continue to war game it and uh, look at it, incorporating it into all of our fleet exercises. Uh, how, do we, how do we do that? And especially if we, with a limited, you know, if we take a hit and lose one of our supply ships, that, that, that's gonna be a significant yeah, uh, loss to the Navy mm -hmm. and to the other services that depend on those, mm -hmm. that support. So uh, all things that we're, we're working on. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt, Mike highlighted, made me think of something. I, I, I would, would say or suggest that, that large scale capability in a LISCO environment and MDO for all of us is a joint force. Mm -hmm also truly underscores the, the importance of host nation support and a close yeah. relationship with our international partners. Yeah. It could be as simple as country X is providing the fuel mm -hmm. or are they giving you the rights to enter the country? So, so all that needs to be factored in. And I would ar argue even now at the lowest level, not we can get at it through education. Uh, th that type of challenge could be included in one of the scenarios at the combat training centers. That type of challenge likely will uh, be incorporated with the joint level exercises that all of us do. Could be an Army Corps warfighting exercises exercise, or a COCOM level, ASCC level joint exercise, mm -hmm. where the country might be physically replicated or or notionally replicated. But you have to work through all of that. Um, so this big globe of ours gets very small <laughs> quickly, and all that should be factored in. And, and again, I think it can be exercised from the basic level, where you're really good at the basic blocking and tackling, and echeloned up, not only through our brick and mortar education, but joint training opportunities. And this MDO theater is gonna demand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and i guilty of rose-colored glasses all the time, but feel pretty optimistic we're getting at it. Yeah, Very optimistic. Sure. No, that's great to hear, sir. Uh, and, and great points as well. And, and you talked about you know, LVC, live virtual and constructive training. Mm -hmm. Um, that gives me a great segue to the next question. Um, so I'm going to read a, a, a somewhat long quote from the Chief of Naval Operations, but she recently stated that by 2027, we will have reliable, realistic, relevant, and recordable live virtual and constructive enabled architectures to train Navy warfighters to successfully execute high-end warfighting in joint and fully informed training environments. LVC will be available independent of geographic location, providing the ability to build tactical proficiency anywhere, deployed or pierside. The Army is no stranger to LVC, as you mentioned, even making the synthetic training environment a priority when it created a cross-functional team dedicated to that capability. So along that line, sir, how does LVC and capabilities like it help us better integrate our training across services so that soldiers and sailors will be able to operate in sync with one another? The live virtual constructed environment, and in my non-doctrinal ad, we can put a J, a joint in front of that. Mm -hmm. One, it's, it's, it's an expensive investment, but a worthwhile one, because it gives you a, an, a live virtual constructive, it could be a virtual uh, at a core echelon linked to dirt training of some type. But it gives all the joint capabilities an opportunity to exercise the, the entirety of the battlefield framework of which we would operate, uh, exercise threats and capabilities across up and down all the domains into one system. Of course, you, you, you work time horizons and all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's the one at one huge environment we can pull all that in together. So I, 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 I agree with what that you read, what you read. Um, that those, those capabilities are there and we're developing those systems to give us just that. And you think about it, this may be a poor example, but something I think no service should, should want to ever have to do 
you know, mass casualties, mass medical evacuations, and mm -hmm. things like that. But you can exercise it in an, L, in an LBC environment. Mm -hmm. Then echelon down the investment that the Army has made, I'm sure the other services are doing the same on the synthetic training environment capabilities. It gives you an opportunity to exercise uh, training without live rounds in some respects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pull in some of the cap uh, capabilities. So I've already seen prototypes and systems where you change the software, not the hardware. A new system where you change the software, I am now training on what it's really like for me to fly this Apache helicopter. Mm -hmm. I can change the software and what it's really going to be like for me to operate this new XM uh, mechanized vehicle in the future. It could mm -hmm. be any variety of systems. And I know the other services are pulling in the same. And then uh, you may be in this LVC of the future, now and in the future, allows to pull all of that in as well, where the pilot might see what the Navy ship is doing and vice versa. Uh, so although an expensive investment, it is one worthy, in my opinion, of building that purple war fighting readiness. Mm -hmm. I've taken enough mic time. Leave General, it uh, uh, couldn't agree with you more. And uh, at the uh, risk of trying to uh, add on to what you've already quoted from CNO, um, uh, NWDC is what we call a tier one node in the LVC Navy continuous training environment network. We build the scenarios that get incorporated into the uh, uh, the global, uh, the geographic combatant commander uh, tier one exercises. Um, so we, we live LVC day in, day out and the value, you know, the, the, we don't have to get ships underway. We don't, like you said, we don't have to ex ex uh, expend those weapons. We can provide a, uh, a realistic adversary threat mm -hmm. to ships at, at pier side or at sea, aircraft in the air, shore facilities, and they can get multiple reps and sets that, you know, we don't sometimes just don't have the time exactly. to do. So there's so much value to LVC and, you know, so just piling on to what, what your quote that you read from CNO, um, the, the, the value is only going to increase. And, mm -hmm. uh, General, if you ever get over to the south side, I'd love to have you come over and take a look at our uh, LVC facility and the new one that we built out in Virginia Beach at Dam Neck uh, uh, Naval Base that uh, we operate at the higher levels yes. with, the, mm -hmm. with the mocks coordinating with the fleet headquarters, but down at the waterfront level, c the carrier strike groups, the amphibious writing units groups, individual ships and aircraft out at Dam Neck, uh, we just uh, opened this up this year. So uh, we're all in on LVC. Well, I'll take that as an invitation. Yeah, yeah. You got it, sir. You know, Matt, you, you mentioned something in the opening, which um, the operational environment. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure the joint service all look at that, whether it's a future operation environment or, or your, your service aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I would offer up that the, the, the human intellectual capital and sweat that goes into that OE allows you to plug into that LVC Absolutely. scenario. So that's real. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're truly not going against a make-believe threat, but it's something that is understood to be the OE. And lastly, and I know uh, all the services work on this, I know for sure the Navy does have enriched some of the stuff, uh, and a, a increased demand for great relationships mm -hmm. with industry partners, uh, leveraging 3D printing, other capabilities that allow us to, to do the sustainment that we need, but it may not be as costly. Uh, if, if you can use robotics or human-machine interaction or 3D printing to either save a million dollars or save a life, can't go wrong. Right. Yeah, that's a great point, sir. So this has been a wonderful conversation so far. We've got a few minutes left. I did want to try to get in one last question. Maybe Certainly. we can incorporate that into your closing remarks. Mm -hmm. Sure. So thinking about it in terms of where we're at now, what does this relationship look like 10 years from now, what do we need to do to make this successful? And then I'll, we'll go right into closing remarks, sir. No, certainly, I, and actually that, that's a big benefit that I, a, that I had in this last 45 minutes, so, so thanks on this, is look for opportunities and, and put pen to pencil and, and make it happen on any professional military education opportunities we may have, for, not only for officers, but anybody, uh, whether it's through training, uh, schools, LPDs like this, to underscore the importance of being really good at the uniform I wear, pardon my grunt language, but yet understanding the purpleness that comes with it, to include our civilian professionals. 
Uh, so, th so that's key. So that my big takeaway, as we steam, pardon, no pun intended, steam ahead <laughs> on being good at LISCO and MDO, widen that, widening those opportunities to bring in the, the joint development of it. I'm with you, General. All ahead flank. Um, <laughs> yes, it's the uh, the way ahead is is in the joint fight and. Uh, how we come together. We've talked about project convergence. We've talked about LVC. Um, I think JADC2 and the, the way yeah. we go forward there. Um, we have to have that seamless uh, networks that we can exchange data back and forth. Um, you've talked about having a single radio yeah. that, that, uh, that all four services can use and not having to deal with those kind of uh, interoperability challenges. and. Um, and I'm also interested in seeing where we go with, in the future, with robotics, uh, unmanned systems, how we incorporate uh, artificial intelligence and yeah. machine, uh, man-machine learning into it. You know, the carrier strike groups and amphibious rating groups of the future are going to be a combination of manned and unmanned systems, ships, aircraft, et cetera. So. Um, how does that? How do? How do we incorporate that into uh, our, our joint operations? No, 100%. Um, and we're at the fighting edge of it and continuing on the human machine interaction, robotics, where we can, mm -hmm. if it gives you the same capability, you don't have to put a breathing human there to do it, all mm -hmm. the better. Mm -hmm. And something you mentioned, I think continued ethical use of AI, not going to mm -hmm. stop. Can we use AI machine learning to help us do relatively routine things like right doctrine and POIs quicker? I know all of us face that challenge as mm -hmm. well. So we're, we're the like mind there. Great. Mm -hmm. Right. So, sir, if you'll allow, I think we do have one question from our online audience, and sure. it looks like it's directed to the Navy, so we'll okay. see if we can get an, an answer <laughs> right, for this. Sure. So it comes from Facebook, and it says, does the, does the Navy have a tool like the Quick Fire Portal for rapid upload of lessons learned? Because you mentioned one of the, the six efforts for you guys is, is right. lessons learned. Um, I'm not familiar with the Quick Fire Portal, but yes, there is, um, on the Navy Warfare Development uh, Center's uh, uh, portal, we do have a link to our Navy Lessons Learn uh, program, so um, you can go into Navy Lessons Learn there through Navy, or you can access it through the, the Joint Lessons Learn system mm -hmm. and uh, access the Navy Lessons Learned. And w w the way we set it up is we do have some categories, uh, communities of practice of key areas that uh, uh, most recent one being the operations in uh, uh, the Red Sea and the uh, Levant and uh, lessons learned from ships and the staffs that are operating in that theater, for example. Mm -hmm. it, uh, no, it, it sounds very similar, Mike. Uh, one thing we've developed, this is about maybe nine months to a year old now. So mm -hmm. the Quick Fire Portal is a web-based system where you can be out training at the National Training Center and get a lessons learned. You typed it in, hit send. I'm oversimplifying this. Mm -hmm. But it gets fed into our combined arms center that manages the mm -hmm. doctrine, lesson plans, and others and bends it where it should okay. so that we quickly learn from really? it. So we, we yeah. again, less than a year from, from, con from dry erase board to what it is now, be more than happy to link up with you. But it does, it does expand to the same level that you just mentioned, links mm -hmm. to historical lessons and bigger doctrine. Well, sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that back. Mm -hmm. uh, it just so happens this week we're hosting the Navy Lessons Learned uh, mm -hmm. annual conference at, at, at Navy Warfare Development Excellent. Center. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back this afternoon and talk to my Lessons Learned director and, and give him this one and let, mm -hmm. let them chew on that a little bit and see. I've asked him how do they get AI into um, lessons learned so that the the sailor at sea doesn't have to you know go through multiple sites to get the can he just type in a question and get a data dump of everything in the in the database yep. that re applies to a section um, and I'm gonna do the same thing with doctor and I had a demo of camo AI at uh, uh, out at the Monterey at the yep. postgraduate mm -hmm. school and we're looking to do the same thing with our doctrine as very well. similar very similar sure. yep excellent Sir, it looks like the Navy's very popular. We have another question from Facebook. <laughs> okay. You're up for it. All right. Is that okay? Sure, let's go All right. for it. So it says, is it possible to achieve sea control in today's OE, especially in the Pacific, or is sea denial the best possible outcome? Wow, that's a good one. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I'm glad you got that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sir. Uh, I think, you know, two different things. You know, sea control is where we own the, we own the battle space. And uh, where sea denial is, we're preventing the enemy from using it. 
different. There's a nuance there. It might be a little subtle, but there is some difference in that. Um, and I, I think, in, in uh, as the fight goes, I think we will strive to achieve sea control. In certain areas, we will have it, and as we go into the contested areas, it'll be a fight. But as we roll back, we, we will be able to, in, in in areas we're operating, establish sea control. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. And mm -hmm. sir, I've worked for the Army for. 17 years, so I will take your word for it. So <laughs> anything about the anything about the sea is out of my area of expertise. Uh, so uh, thank you both. As we wind this conversation down, um, I'd just like to offer up if you have any last words before we uh, say goodbye to our audience out there. Well, bo both to the audience and Mr. Durkin, thank you for mm -hmm. this opportunity. I've always uh, looked for any opportunity to get better in my own foxhole. And as mm -hmm. a joint force, I think we highlighted some great opportunities ahead for all of us here. And as we continue to get ready for this ever-evolving uh, operational environment, could be uh, get gathering lessons learned mm -hmm. in Ukraine conflict right now mm -hmm. and helps us as better service, I think we all share the same mm -hmm. urgency yeah. uh, to be ready if called upon. And I, and I do think this multi-domain threat that we have globally, my words, or just being a MDO-capable joint force underscores uh, the importance of being really, really good in your service and really, really good with the other services. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gergen? Again, Matt, uh, appreciate, uh, thank you for hosting it, and General, for the invitation to- Thank uh, you. It's um, been a, a privilege to uh, uh, talk about my Navy to your uh, your uh, uh, dedicated TRADOC warriors. Uh, I hope they take away a little bit of where Navy is going and how, how we uh, uh, value uh, the interoperability and where we're going with the joint fight and that we're we are in this together um it's uh uh we we have a we have a a challenge ahead of us and i think that uh, uh as we tackle it together you know we will overcome like we always have so um, i appreciate that and, and with that sir you know i, I would be negligent mm -hmm. if i didn't uh, send you know close out with a, a go navy beat army sir we well, can, I'll say go on and be that. Navy. But <laughs> yeah, we can cut that, sir. <laughs> Either way, it'll be a great game. Absolutely. Looking forward well, to it. Thank you for the opportunity. And yep. Thank you. So as we've heard today, there's a substantial need for Army-Navy cooperation. Here in the Army, we consistently note that no matter the enemy, no matter the location, we don't go to war alone. We are part of a joint force whose cooperation is paramount to achieving victory. As our pacing threat China continues to modernize and grow its forces, the Indo-Pacific region becomes of great strategic and operational importance. The open ocean is no longer the sanctuary it once was, and even smaller regional conflicts near the Mediterranean and Red Sea continue to challenge naval forces. As we look to the years ahead, it becomes clear just how important the relationship is between TRADOC and the Navy Warfare Development Center for the creation of doctrine, training programs, concepts, and capabilities to fight tonight, tomorrow, and in the future. Join us for our next Leader Professional Development on December 3rd with Mr. Formica and guest speaker Nathan Whitaker to talk about mentor leadership. Stay tuned to TRADOC social media platform for further advertisements of that Leader Professional Development. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, victory starts here.